Finance and Administration here at WVU Parkersburg. And it's my honor to welcome you to the campus tonight for our program on human trafficking in West Virginia. I also want to say a special welcome to those who are joining us in our Jackson County Center through our streaming process. Welcome to you also. Tonight's presentation is the first in a series of events planned by the College of Social Justice Committee. Um, by offering events such as, the, as these, our Social Justice Committee hopes to provide activities that promote tolerance and appreciation for diversity and a better understanding of social justice issues. Among the things, the offerings that we have this fall include a uh, film series at the Smoot Theater in conjunction with them on challenges to democracy. The first film is actually next week on the 13th. Um, it's the film entitled Lincoln. Uh, students get to come for free. Uh, $5 admission for everyone else, so we would encourage you to try to come. Um, we also have other events planned for the fall, and I would encourage you to watch the website and social media so that you can have a better idea of when those events are planned. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask Debbie Richards, Special Assistant to the President and um, for uh, Social Justice, to come up and introduce our speaker in our program. The topic of human trafficking has been one that our Social Justice Committee has wanted to add to our awareness program for quite some time now. So we're really pleased to have with us this evening uh, Dr. Patrick Kerr, who is a licensed clinical psychologist and an associate professor in the Department of Behavioral Medicine and Psychiatry at West Virginia University School of Medicine in Charleston. Dr. Kerr directs the WVU Behavioral Science and Psychopathology Research Division, as well as the WVU Dialectical Behavior Therapy Services Program, which provides treatment to suicidal adolescents and adults. He earned his doctoral degree in clinical psychology at the University of North Dakota in 2008. Dr. Kerr part participates in service to several state agencies and organizations including the West Virginia Child Fatality Review Team and the West Virginia Emergency Medical Services for Children Advisory Committee, for which he chairs the Behavioral and Psychiatric Emergencies Subcommittee. He is the current president of the West Virginia Council for the Prevention of Suicide. As a member of the West Virginia Human Trafficking Task Force and its steering committee, Dr. Kerr chairs the Human Trafficking Activity Monitoring Committee. In addition to publications pertaining to suicidal behavior, non-suicidal self-injury, and traumatic stress, he has published multiple book chapters and peer-reviewed publications on human trafficking. The topic of his presentation this evening is Understanding Human Trafficking in West Virginia, a Statewide Perspective on a Worldwide Program. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patrick Kerr. Thank you, Debbie. How's the sound coming through for everyone in the back there? Good. All right. Um, try not to make the microphones conflict with one another. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, none of what Debbie just read about anything that I do is half as important as the work that all of you can do to get involved in anti-human trafficking work. And one of my goals with any human trafficking talk, any presentation, um, is to talk a bit about human trafficking in general so that uh, if you're not familiar with human trafficking, if you're not familiar with this phenomenon, you walk out with a little bit more information, but also to talk about the work that's being done to address it in our state, uh, which includes uh, work that can uh, be done by people perhaps in this room that you yourselves may choose to get involved in uh, in a variety of ways. And uh, if you have an interest in learning more about ways to get involved in combating trafficking, if you want to go from learning about it today to perhaps doing something about it, I'd be happy uh, to speak with anyone about that after the presentation, either directly after or uh, via email or telephone. Um, Debbie's already given me a quite kind introduction. Um, the most relevant thing here is that I, I do work with the West Virginia Human Trafficking Task Force. And I think sometimes it's um, confusing to for folks to think about a psychologist being involved 
in a task force, uh, I think the images that often come to mind when we think about a task force, especially human trafficking task force, is that it probably involves kicking in doors, um, there needs to be a battering ram, we're going to go in and rescue people. Um, and anti-trafficking work actually involves a lot more than what we would think of as or be viewed as rescue operations uh, for trafficking victims. In fact, much anti-trafficking work, most of the anti-trafficking work that needs to be done uh, happens outside of those contexts, outside of those images that we may have stuck in our minds from the media uh, or from movies, television, the news, etc. So my roles uh, have included uh, helping to develop a protocol for identifying human trafficking survivors and beginning to work on a system for uh, actually mapping the patterns of human trafficking within our state. And I'll talk about some of the work that our task force is doing during the presentation today. Um, I, I would say as we go forward here, in trying to meet these objectives, I'm going to balance me doing some talking with uh, some video presentations. You saw me doing some testing of the sound and video earlier here. Uh, whether it's something that I talk about or something that you hear or see in a video, if you feel uh, uncomfortable, if it's something that you feel uh, you just can't really handle, you're not ready to handle that today, I'm not going to be offended if you decide to leave early. You've got to do what you've got to do to take care of yourself. So please uh, take the time that you need to take care of yourself as you see fit. Uh, as we're working toward our objectives of learning about human trafficking, what it is as a phenomenon, how human trafficking continues the practice of slavery in the modern era, or era, um, what signs of human trafficking all of us, regardless of what work you're doing, what area you're working in, can be tuning into, and how we can help human trafficking survivors, what we're doing about it in West Virginia. And hopefully along the way, we're gonna clarify myths about human trafficking. Uh, toward the end of the presentation, uh, I'll welcome any questions that you have. If I say something that doesn't make sense or you want me to clarify something along the way, though, please do jump up with a question. Raise your hand. I'm happy to answer things along the way as well. Let's talk about some of the basics of human trafficking, what this actually is as a phenomenon. So first, human trafficking is modern-day slavery. I always add modern-day a little bit hesitantly. That is a common way of describing human trafficking. It's just slavery. It is slavery that is continuing to occur in the modern era. We have not done a very effective job at eradicating slavery throughout the course of human history. For about two millennia now, um, there have been proclamations by monarchs. There have been uh, legislative actions taken across the world to abolish slavery, but we haven't actually eradicated it. We made it against the law a couple of different times, at least a few times in this country, first with the 13th Amendment, then with the Mann Act in 1910, again in 2000 with the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. We call it different things, but we're not really getting to the root of it. So the most recent effort was in 2000 with the, victim, the passage of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, uh, which redefined slavery uh, using the term human trafficking and human trafficking refers to situations in which people are victimized by somebody else that is forcing or coercing or otherwise compelling them through fraud to participate in some kind of work, whether it is sexual labor or non-sexual labor. They are being coerced, they are being forced, they are being fraudulently influenced to engage in work against their will. Federal law and international law recognizes two primary forms of human trafficking. I'll talk today about some other types of, some subtypes of human trafficking, but the two primary types are labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Labor trafficking and sex trafficking are not necessarily mutually exclusive. If someone is not free, they are not free. So if I've enslaved someone, to perform non-sexual labor, and I see that I might benefit financially from sexual labor through commercial sexual exploitation, uh, I may decide that I would like to compel that person to work in a commercial sexual venue as well, providing commercial sexual services. 
So it's important to recognize these are not mutually exclusive categories. Labor trafficking, when it is non-sexual in nature, refers to the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor, again, that is non-sexual, uh, for labor or services through force, fraud, and coercion. The stipulation force, fraud, and coercion is new in our conceptualization of slavery in the modern era. I will say that one of the new ways of thinking about people being enslaved is that it can happen through coercion. It doesn't necessarily require physical restraint. It doesn't necessarily require physical force. Just the coercion that may go along with threats to the victim or the victim's family or things of great value to the victim can be enough to be considered slavery when it is used to compel them to perform work, perform labor. Sex trafficking is nearly identical to labor trafficking in its definition, except that the labor we are talking about now is sexual in nature in some way. And I will describe the different venues in which both labor trafficking and sex trafficking have been identified um, in just a few slides here. I'm going to shift to talking a bit about West Virginia's history with human trafficking legislatively. Um, again, in a federal context, human trafficking was outlawed in 2000. Uh, with the passage of the TVPA, Trafficking Victim Protection Act. Um, in West Virginia, human trafficking was first outlawed in 2012. So we are relatively new uh, newcomers to uh, the legislative prohibition against trafficking. The original human trafficking law in West Virginia um, required that two people be trafficked in a single year, two people be enslaved in a single year, to count as trafficking. Uh, the conversation that we had, had with some of uh, your colleagues here uh, earlier today about this, it's, the logic of this is not clear. Um, fortunately, we amended the law um, in 2017, technically in 2016, and then it went into effect in 2017. And there were two important changes that happened. The first, was that we no longer had the requirement of two victims within a single year uh, to, uh, to define trafficking, which meant that state law, state code, aligned with federal law. The other important step that West Virginia took, a very progressive step, I should add, uh, is that we are now a safe harbor state. So as of 2017, uh, minors can no longer be charged with prostitution. So thinking about sex trafficking specifically, West Virginia took a, st a step that not all states have taken in uh, becoming a safe harbor state. Okay, so there are a wide range of places where human trafficking occurs. Sometimes human trafficking occurs in sectors of business that we might expect it to occur, places that would be prototypical or stereotypical venues for human trafficking to occur. And sometimes it occurs in places that we would never have guessed it might be possible to enslave someone. So in 2017, Polaris, formerly known as Polaris Project, uh, created a typology of modern slavery that outlined the wide range of places in which human trafficking victims have been identified. These include agriculture and animal husbandry, illicit massage, health and beauty businesses, domestic work and servitude, traveling sales crews, peddling and begging. begging. Again, these would be forced peggy, begging and peddling rings. These would be forced work in traveling sales crews, restaurant and food service work, hotels and hospitality, recreational facilities of all forms, illicit businesses, so think narcotic sales, the sale of stolen goods, landscaping, construction, factories and manufacturing, which again may be one of the more prototypical uh, venues that we would think of when we think about what human trafficking involves or where it happens. Cleaning services, arts and entertainment, carnivals, forestry and logging, and even healthcare. So in each one of these venues, at least one victim of human trafficking, one person who has been enslaved to work in these sectors has been identified, at least one in each one of these. The one that is most surprising to me 
and perhaps uh, among the most appalling because I work in healthcare uh, is healthcare itself being a venue for human trafficking. So that's labor trafficking subtypes. With sex trafficking, outdoor prostitution, residential prostitution, escort services, personal sexual servitude, remote interactive sexual acts, so think webcam sexual encounters. I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Bars, strip clubs, cantinas, pornography. So some of these may seem like stereotypical than used for human trafficking, and some may be more surprising to you, again, both with labor and sex trafficking. The message here is that there's a wide range of places in which someone may be trafficked. And it's important that we look beyond our own assumptions, wherever those assumptions may have come from, however they developed, it's important we look beyond our own assumptions about what slavery looks like in the modern era. It's happening in places we would guess and happening in places that we would never imagine. So I'm going to shift now to talking about some numbers related to human trafficking. I've got a whole lot of caveats before I dive into this because we do not have very good data on human trafficking prevalence. The reason for that is that human trafficking often exists in a fairly clandestine place. It's hidden from view. Even if it's right in front of us, it's not something that's happening in an obvious way. So trying to determine exact precise numbers of human trafficking victims or human trafficking incidents is notoriously difficult. Nonetheless, there are organizations that have done the best work possible with increasingly improved research methodology, some of which we're borrowing from in our own work in West Virginia, um, that provide us with the best estimates possible. So first, this is a diagram of the conceptualization used for defining human trafficking by the International Labor Organization, which is a subdivision of the United Nations. Modern slavery is divided for research purposes, epidemiological purposes, into forced labor and forced marriage. And this is as of the most recent uh, publication of human trafficking estimates in 2017, September of last year. Within forced labor, there is state and post forced labor, which would be prison labor, uh, as well as uh, military conscription, forced labor exploitation, and forced sexual exploitation. So state imposed forced labor, which is within the purview of a state or a nation uh, to impose, perhaps part of policy or law that allows that to happen, and forced labor, which is perhaps illegal in any setting that it's occurring in, and forced sexual exploitation, which would likely also be illegal in any venue in which it's occurring. So with this as our rubric, these are the estimates that have been generated most recently, again, as of last year, uh, by the International Labor Organization. Um, and the full range of human trafficking prevalence in also includes work uh, by the Walk Free Foundation, which has been doing parallel work to estimate human trafficking globally. So currently, there's an, there are an estimated 40 to about 45, almost 46 million people estimated to be living in slavery. So I'll let that sink in for a moment, because these are pretty daunting numbers, I think. Within those estimates, approximately 15 to 16 million of those are labor trafficking victims, close to 3 million of whom are children. About 5 million, almost 5 million, are sex trafficking victims, about 1 million of whom are estimated to be children. Forced marriage constitutes 15 and a half million, about 5 and a half million of those being children. And state-imposed forced labor constitutes about 4 million, with about a quarter million being represented by children. We look at where sex trafficking happens. I'll ask you to excuse the typo at the top of the page there. The majority of the sex trafficking that's been identified occurs in the Asian Pacific Rim nations, with the next highest prevalence rate being in Europe and Central Asia, followed by Africa, 
North and South America, and the Middle East. What's important to consider is that while a substantial proportion of people across subtypes of human trafficking are trafficked within their own nation, uh, this varies by the type of trafficking that occurs. So, for example, people who are sex trafficked are more likely to be trafficked in a place other than their native country. About a quarter of all trafficking victims are trafficked within their country of origin, within their native country. That is almost reversed for sex trafficking victims, only one out of four of whom are trafficked within their native country, the large majority of whom are trafficked outside of their country of origin. Labor trafficking is primarily comprised of people who are trafficked within their own country. So the risk of being relocated and the added vulnerabilities that go along with relocation is starkly different for sex trafficking survivors. If we zoom in from a global perspective to more of a local perspective, this heat map represents uh, phone calls to the human trafficking hotline that's operated by the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. Um, even though these phone call data don't reflect estimates of prevalence or incidents, they do reflect a combination of incidents and awareness of human trafficking, meaning that as people become more aware of human trafficking, they're more likely to identify situations that they think are human trafficking, and they're more likely to reach out to provide help to find ways to get somebody help, or to at least get information about what they might be able to do with situations of human trafficking. Um, the U.S. government, the U.S. State Department estimates that approximately 14,000 up to about 18,000 people may be trafficked into the United States from elsewhere. Again, we don't have very hard data on those because human trafficking uh, data, again, exist in a clandestine context. Um, there are also an estimated 600,000 to 800,000 people globally that are trafficked across borders. So that doesn't mean that uh, these are the only new trafficking victims that emerge every year. It just means people who are trafficked from one place to another. So thinking back to people who are sex trafficked, for example, um, being trafficked to another country. That's what we would be talking about with that second bullet point. And then there are an estimated 244,000 children and adolescents who are at risk of being trafficked. And I want to zoom in on that uh, data point for just a moment. Um, we sometimes hear estimates of the number of children who are being trafficked that sort of hover around that number. Sometimes, and perhaps you yourself have heard estimates such as 300,000 children uh, are currently living in sexual slavery in the United States. Um, what we know from the best data available is that there are a substantial proportion of children who are at risk of being trafficked, uh, meaning that they are in situations such as living in foster care, uh, living in homeless shelters, or living uh, on the streets and uh, not having any shelter at all, being uh, exposed to violence in their family, being oppressed in various ways based on racial or gender identity or sexual orientation, there are a number of kids who are at risk of being trafficked. That doesn't necessarily mean that all of those children are being trafficked. And it is important that we aim for the best numbers possible so that we know um, what the scope of the problem is. And one of the things that's important to me related to that is that we know whether or not we're actually making a dent with any of the efforts that we undertake, because that is essential. We have to operate based on the best evidence available, both for characterizing the scope of the problem and defining our outcome for interventions. We zoom in further from a nationwide perspective to a statewide perspective. We are in the beginning stages of understanding human trafficking here in West Virginia. On my timeline earlier, you might have noted that uh, around 2015, during 2015, the West Virginia human trafficking, at that time it was defined or described as the Human Trafficking and Civil Rights 
Task Force. Um, it is now just the West Virginia Human Trafficking Task Force with the civil rights part uh, being its own separate task force. That formed during 2015 uh, and became more formally organized uh, over the course of the following year. And at this point, our efforts to understand human trafficking uh, and the scope of human trafficking in West Virginia uh, consist of the uh, West Virginia, or excuse me, the Mountain State Human Trafficking Mapping Project. And I'll talk a bit more about that later on in the presentation. But we are currently in the process of better understanding where human trafficking happens and how often it happens in different settings. Again, in the service of being able to direct the necessary resources to those settings, to those places, so that we can better serve those victims. More on that later. All right. Let's move forward to talking about how we think about human trafficking, some key factors uh, to understand when it comes to the process of being trafficked. This is the AMP model, which allows us to understand step-by-step step what happens when somebody gets trafficked. Um, AMP stands for Action, Method, and Purpose. So if you're wondering, is this human trafficking? Does what I'm seeing constitute human trafficking? We're looking for these specific actions. Recruitment, harboring, keeping someone somewhere, moving someone, transportation, inducing someone to do something, trying to compel them to do something, using force, fraud, or coercion. Force, fraud, or coercion, any of those would constitute human trafficking. They do not, the person does not have to be physically restrained. They do not have to have ever actually been physically attacked. Just the threat of physical attack to the person or to their loved ones would be enough to constitute human trafficking because it's enough to compel someone to do something they otherwise wouldn't do. How many of you have a family member that lives more than 100 miles away from here? Just about everybody. Okay. How many of you know right now whether that family member is safe? Boy, not as many hands. <laughs> How many of you thought that if I told you to do something you didn't want to do, you could probably take me down physically, take me out physically? <laughs> oh, man. I need to get back to the gym. <laughs> so you, you might think, well, if someone tells me to do something that I don't want to do, Someone tells anyone to do something they don't want to do, and you can take them out, you can find a way to fight that off, you do it, right? You do it. But if I told you, you know, that family member that lives 100 miles away that for whatever reason you don't know, with 100% certainty if they're safe, I could make sure that that person stays safe if you do what I'm asking you to do. If you go out on the street tonight, and you make at least $1,000 for me by selling sex, I, I, can make sure, I can make sure your family members stay safe. It would be so unfortunate if something bad were to happen to that family member. And I can make sure, perhaps I would tell you, that my friends go check on that family member just to make sure he or she safe. But one way or another, I'm going to make sure that my friends go visit that family member. And depending on what you decide to do, what you say to me right now, yes or no, are you going to go out there on the street? Are you going to do what I want? Whether my friends tell me that that family member of yours is safe or not, that's going to depend on that answer that I get from you. Right? And you don't know that they're safe to begin with. All you know is that I seem to have the ability to reach that person that you care about, right? I don't have to tell you that that could be quite compelling for someone, especially if they're not native to this country, if it's not 100 miles, but 1,000 miles, right? 
So you don't have, you know, the, the question of whether you could take me out, whether you could physically attack me and get away becomes kind of a moot point, right? Because I've got something else that's going to compel you. And here's why. Involuntary servitude of any kind, debt bondage, slavery. That example pertains to sexual exploitation. But again, any of the above. Action, method, and purpose. When you call the human trafficking hotline, by the way, that's operated by Polaris, the National Human Trafficking Resource Center, this, these are criteria that they are going to be looking at in the information that you provide to determine whether the case that you're calling about, the situation you're calling about, uh, is a case of human trafficking. All right, so if we want to understand who gets trafficked, you know, who kind of falls into that scenario or the type of scenario that I just sort of walked through, um, we've got a sort of a Venn diagram. An inter there's an intersectionality that underpins human trafficking. There are people who are in high-risk populations, people that are more vulnerable socially, economically, politically. There are people who are in high-risk situations. They're not in safe situations, whether it's because they're a kid who is being physically or sexually abused or because they are living in a violent home of some kind as an adult or they're living in an environment uh, that is politically unstable or where there is a high rate of violent crime and organized crime that threatens their safety or their family's safety. And then there are psychosocial risk factors that would include everything from psychiatric disorders, health conditions, economic problems and destitution, economic disadvantage. We've got millions of people that fall into all of these categories individually. When they start to intersect and overlap, those are the people that are most vulnerable to being trafficked both for labor and sexual exploitation. So I'm going to unpack some of those factors and again, specifically related to sex trafficking here, since that is our main topic today, I do want you to recognize that these factors can apply to labor trafficking as well. So there are individual risk factors um, and these pertain to people across the age span, um, physical and sexual abuse or neglect, the history involvement with child protective services, uh, being in juvenile justice system, law enforcement encounters, running away from home, sexual denigration of themselves that may have started with abuse experiences, limited education, being in a foster care setting. These are individual risk factors that research has found increases someone's risk for being trapped, especially increases a child's risk for being sex trafficked if we're talking about a minor. Many children fall into, many people fall into this group of risk factors or experience one or more of this group of risk factors. When those risk factors coincide with family risk factors, which include poverty and unemployment, limited education, Recurrent family dysfunction of various kinds, whether it be criminality, untreated, poorly treated, undertreated psychiatric disorders, substance use disorders, um, families that perceive children or view children as more objects rather than people who don't really see the inherent rights of children. Um, when these intersect, when these coincide, then risk starts to increase for that child. And if we're talking about an adult who has come from this background, risk starts to increase for that adult as well. But again, these do not exist in a vacuum. When those risk factors also exist in a community context in which there is high crime, especially high organized crime, high rates of organized crime, when there are a lack, it's just a lack of resources for children and families, whether it be economically or through inadequate access to health care or health care coverage, when there are social norms that tolerate exploitation, which are prevalent, by the way, in areas and ways that we may not even recognize as being tolerant of exploitation. Um, when there is adult prostitution occurring in an area, when there is a transient male population, especially in boom industry areas. Um, I went to the University of North Dakota for uh, grad, my graduate degree, my, my doctoral degree, 
And one of the things that I've heard way too much about since I left is uh, the boom in the Bakken oil fields and the subsequent increase in human trafficking that has occurred in and around the sudden surge uh, of oil that's being extracted because there is a large proportion or a large number of people coming in who are just working in the oil fields or there temporarily. And that is a target market for human traffickers, sex traffickers specifically. And then societal, so going beyond just community, when there's a lack of awareness of child sex trafficking in general or human trafficking in general, when we sexualize children, not just girls, but children, period, when we treat children, view children as sex objects, when we glorify um, pimp culture, um, another word for pimp really is human trafficker, sex trafficker, um, when law enforcement uh, is corrupt, when we do not enforce the laws that exist related to human trafficking, uh, when there is political corruption that does not support legislation that protects people from human trafficking. Sex tourism is condoned when people look the other way. Um, these are societal broad factors that are likely to exacerbate those community risk factors, exacerbate family risk factors, and really exploit those individual factors. Human traffickers know all of this, by the way. They know this and they use it intentionally. The ways in which human traffickers exploit and enslave other people is intentional and strategic. When we look at some subsets of uh, high-risk populations, such as those who are homeless, uh, especially homeless children and adolescents, kids who report exchanging sex for money in the past year are three times more likely to report having run away in the past year. Right? So if I'm tell a clinician that I'm working with, if I tell a researcher that is trying to ascertain um, the relationships among variables here, uh, that I am I've traded sex for money, I am likely to have run away at least three times, which is a red flag for human trafficking with kids. We are looking at kids who are running away from something, but often running toward an even more dangerous situation. They may also be running away from trafficking that's happening at home. Up to about a quarter of homeless youth report exchanging sex for money or shelter. We refer to this as survival sex. Survival sex can quickly and very easily be transformed into human trafficking, into sex trafficking specifically. And it's worth, it's worth considering that homeless youth are also vulnerable to labor trafficking, not just sex trafficking. Again, the vulnerabilities make them susceptible to being exploited for any form of labor because that labor can be exchanged for meeting their basic needs. When we think about who traffics people and specifically who traffics children for sex, most children know the person who traffics them. There is often a misconception that comes from a variety of different sources that people are sort of picked up by a stranger on the street, usually in a white van, it's windowless, they're kidnapped, and that's how they get forced into being trafficked. That does happen. Um, but more often than not, especially for kids, they know their trafficker, whether it's a parent who's trafficking the child or a partner, a an older boyfriend or girlfriend um, that has intentionally connected with that kid for the purposes of trafficking them. Um, and many children who are reported as trafficking victims have had a previous allegation of child abuse against them. They, they've been identified. Someone has said that someone's abusing this kid. There have been, there's been some signal out there that just didn't get through all the noise that might be going on in this kid's life. Okay. I'm going to pause for just a minute and stop talking myself for a moment and play a video that uh, is an interview with someone who previously worked uh, in the uh, adult dancing, the new dancing industry, and also uh, used that as a venue to sex traffic uh, people that were working in that venue. And he's going, you're going to hear him talk about uh, the ways in which he and the people that uh, ran this club with him thought about 
uh, the victims that they were working with and the business that they were running. Hope that the sound works. A lot of what we, we would do as a, as a management team would be you could play your good guy, bad guy routine and literally change people from being a waitress into a dancer by that. What you would do is wait until you see the girl with a new car a new apartment, new furniture, and then tell her that she no longer has a job because you don't need waitresses. But yet, it's okay if you want to dance, plus you'll make more money. And you don't want to lose your new car. You don't want to lose all these people you're friends with now. So why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you dance? Uh, another one is, you know, you can take them to dinner, explain to them that you're short on amateur contestants that night, that they don't have to take their clothes off. At least just get on stage, you need the extra body. And make them feel guilty for not doing it because you're their friend. They want to make you happy. They want to please you. Everybody in the whole world, and this includes the person who was brought up in a Christian home. This includes the person who was brought up with money. This includes the person who was brought up with no money. They want to feel needed. They want to feel wanted. What my job was, was to find out what made them feel, what made them want, and what I could fulfill of those needs in order to get them to do what I wanted them to do. A lot of what I would do is on a weekly basis, I would talk to every one of the people that worked for me and I would keep it on tape and I would review it to see if I was doing what needed to be done to keep that person towing the line. Uh, I would have mandatory meetings to where I would talk about such trivial things as how much toilet paper they could use just in order to let them know that if you can't make a decision on how much toilet paper to use, how could you ever make a decision to leave? They became totally dependent on the club due to the hours that they would work. If they're working from nine in the morning till four in the morning or from noon till four in the morning, they no longer live in a culture that you and I live in. They live in a subculture and really don't exist and intertwine with any of the things that we see as reality. Their reality is totally different than ours. If the club was to go away, then their friends would be gone, their income would be gone, their personal life would be gone because they'd have no apartment, no car. Literally, if that they did not have that club, they would have no life. Okay. What I want to do is talk about the other side of that equation. So that's the trafficker side. I'm going to ask you all, this is kind of bold of me to ask, I think. I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes for the next video that I play, which might not sound like it makes a lot of sense, but I'll tell you why I'm going to ask you to do it. First, the video itself is comprised primarily of a montage of images that aren't directly related to the information that's being discussed. The other reason I want you to close your eyes is that I want you to imagine what it might be like for the person that's being described in this video. The narrator is Rachel Lloyd, who is a trafficking survivor and the co-founder of Girls Education and Mentoring Service, or GEMS, in New York City, the service organization that exists to serve uh, sex traffic youth. And she describes the sex trafficking victim experience. So if you're willing, if you're willing, I will invite you to close your eyes. If you're not willing to close your eyes, if that's not where you are right now, I would ask that you just look down, put your eyes somewhere that allows you to really envision what this person's experience is like.
you know, you're 12 years old and you're living with your moms and your moms are struggling because she didn't think that life was really going to work out like this for her and she doesn't have a man around and the men that are around haven't always been that great. Sexual abuse is becoming kind of normal for you and you think that other people don't have secrets that are as bad as you and maybe you've tried to talk to somebody at school and they haven't really heard you or maybe they just haven't had time to listen to you. And so you're seeing these girls on, on the videos and they're so pretty and they're so sexy. And, and so your way at 12 of escaping into this fantasy world is to think about what it must be like to be one of these girls. And you know that adult men already look at you and you wonder how you can kind of use that. I was just a child and that's how I was supposed to be, like a child. So one day you're coming out of school and there's a guy outside in a Cadillac and he's he's nice looking. I mean, he's he's got the baseball cap and the jeans and the Tims and he tells you how pretty you are and you know how pretty your hair looks. And it's been a while since anybody even really noticed anything about you. And for the first time, you feel like somebody's really interested in you because now all of a sudden he's asking you about your dreams and your hopes and where your father's at. And he says that he can be a daddy to you. shouldn't have depend on I'm depending on for support for support for support And so that night he takes you to a club and he puts you up on the stage and he gives you a few drinks and there's men throwing dollars at you. And it's scary, but all the time you're just looking at his face in the back of the room and he's like, you know, go ahead, baby girl, go ahead. You're doing it for daddy. And you're feeling proud because nobody's ever said that to you. And so then that night he tells you that there's more stuff that you've got to do. And he takes you into a room and there's a man there. And he tells you to strip and you think this is something you'll never do. And yet, there's a part of you that already knew how to do this. Because that's what your stepfather's been doing to you all these years before. And so you turn that trick. And it's like a part of you has died inside. And so you come out of the club that night. And you get in the car and you know he's pumping 50 cents. And he takes you to McDonald's. And he tells you, you did a good job tonight, sweetie. And he's stuffing his pockets with the $1,000 that he made. And right now, you're happy. The people that I shouldn't have depended on, I'm depending on for support. For support. like this is the best that it's ever going to get and everything else in your life has prepared you for this moment all the sexual abuse or the neglect or the drama or the pain or the trauma has prepared you for tonight where you stepped across a line that you always thought you'd never really quite step across and you don't realize that night what it'll be like to be on the track and get raped and you don't realize that daddy isn't really going to protect you you don't realize what it's like to have a gun held to your head that night. You don't realize what it's going to be like when you catch your first STD. You don't realize what it's going to be like when you first come home and daddy beats you for the first time because you didn't make enough money. You don't know what it's going to be like to have cops offer to trade sex with you in exchange for not being arrested. And then sometimes you do that and they'll still lock you up anyway. You don't know what it's like to sit up in jail and know that you just made 1500 for your pimp last night, but he won't come down and put $200 bail on just to get you out a few days early. You don't know what it's like to, to walk down the street at 6 o'clock in the morning when you're just getting off work and people are starting their day and they see you and they know what you do and they look at you in a way that you just don't feel like you belong in that world anymore. And you don't know what it's like to feel like you've lost part of yourself along the way and to feel like you'll never leave. And no matter how many times you try to leave, he'll always find you and catch you. But that night, all you care about is the fact you're riding in the Cadillac, and you're eating McDonald's, and you're listening to 50, and you've got this one man who you really think loves you sitting right by your side.
I've sold over $80 million of products on Instagram over the years. I was the youngest founder of a publicly traded company in history for the last 15 So let's talk about some places that we are missing people such as Rachel Lloyd just described. I mentioned that there are ways in which places in which human trafficking occurs that may be right in front of us and we're not even aware of it. Not only does human trafficking occur in places that we may not imagine that it occurs, but human trafficking victims may show up, may present in places that we wouldn't expect them to that provide opportunities for intervention. One of those being healthcare. And this is one of the key places for intervention that we recognize now uh, in anti-trafficking work. So in data pertaining to sex trafficking specifically, up to 87.8% of trafficking survivors, sex trafficking survivors, report that while they were being trafficked, they sought health care at least one time while they were still being trafficked, and no one identified it. That can't be good. Thank you. So this is a key place for intervention. Within those visits, those places that they showed up, about 63% presented to emergency departments for treatment of some health care need. About 21% presented to an urgent care. 22% went to a regular primary care physician. Not their regular primary care physician necessarily, but a PCP clinic, a PCP office. About 30% presented to Planned Parenthood. About close to 20%. Uh, presented to a, a women's clinic. So we know that human trafficking victims are showing up in healthcare. It's really important that we be aware uh, of what signs to look for. It starts with understanding the consequences of human trafficking. Um, so whether you're working in healthcare or not, understanding the health consequences that human trafficking victims experience is important. If you do go on to work in a healthcare setting, um, that, or if you're currently working in a healthcare setting, knowing this is absolutely essential. Um, there are some common general problems with health that we know to be prevalent among people who survive and are currently being victimized by human trafficking. Um, any chronic condition is likely to be poorly managed or, or not managed at all, whether it be diabetes, arthritis, uh, emphysema. The experience of being trafficked it really is one of survival. The, the trafficker is going to provide whatever resources are necessary to keep their victim, to keep their product uh, marketable. And so when they bring that victim in for health care, um, it's likely to be a pretty urgent situation that's gone on for some time, that hasn't been attended to for some time. Um, again, things like dental problems are likely to just get exacerbated over time. Um, the trafficker is going to invest minimal resources in uh, helping to care for the trafficking victim. Um, and I should add, sometimes that may alter. The trafficking trafficker may sometimes shower affection and shower resources temporarily on that victim as a way to further coerce them into doing what they want them to do, to convince them that th this isn't exploitative. This is an actual relationship. Look at what I do for you. I take care of you. Now get back out on the street. Dizziness, hearing and vision problems, pain, chronic pain, back pain, headaches, all of these have been found to be common in victims of human trafficking. Reproductive and gynecological problems, another area uh, that is uh, prevalent uh, for people who are victimized by human traffickers, including pelvic pain, STD, rectal pain, urological problems, all of which would be understandably common in people who are forced to have sex night after night with dozens uh, of clients. Understandably, when 
physical health, non-psychiatric physical health is not attended to, and you live in a chronically stressful environment in which you worry about your safety recurrently, mental health problems also emerge. Depression being among the most common outcomes, mental health outcomes of uh, human trafficking, especially sex trafficking. And I would add that most of these data that I've presented here, most of these statistics come from data on sex trafficking victims. PTSD is common eating disorders. Up to about a third of sex trafficking victims report symptoms consistent with an eating disorder, whether it be bulimia nervosa or anorexia nervosa. Um, one footnote on that, uh, human traffickers will commonly use food as a way to coerce uh, their victims to doing what they want them to do. They will restrain the person uh, from eating more than they uh, allot them in a particular day. They may set up arbitrary rules about how often you can eat, when you can eat, the types of food that you're allowed to eat. Again, all as a way to coerce you into doing what they want you to do as their victim. Uh, substance abuse, quite common. That's one of the things that we are just starting to understand the relationship with here in West Virginia. Um, shame and guilt. And this is not just temporary, brief shame and guilt that any of us might feel. This is pervasive, life-altering shame and guilt. Guilt and shame about one's person, guilt and shame about the things that one has been forced to do that they may feel they are responsible for. It's common for traffickers to convince their victim that they are responsible for the exploitation that's happening to them. They're responsible for the problems that they're experiencing that the trafficker is actually causing for them. Okay, so we know that human trafficking, sex trafficking especially, leads to health problems sort of across the board, and we know that human trafficking victims uh, may appear in places that we're not expecting. So knowing what to look for is important. If I show you this, does anyone see anything here that looks familiar? What do you see? Big Dipper, how do you know that? How, how do you know that this is, is anyone here an astronomer? Astrophysicist? Really, nobody? You just learned at some point that this pattern, right, this pattern is this constellation. The same sort of thing applies to understanding human trafficking and identifying human trafficking victims. There are a lot of red flags that when they occur at the same time should start to congeal around uh, someone being a victim, or potentially being a victim of human trafficking. So things to be asking yourself when you're interacting with someone that you suspect may be a victim of trafficking. Is this person accompanied by somebody else who seems controlling? And that could be a lot of things. Maybe it could just be a controlling, domineering, or violent partner who's not trafficking them, or perhaps that control is for exploitation purposes, for human trafficking. Does a person who's accompanying this other person um, insist on giving you information from them? This is especially true uh, if you are working in a healthcare environment when you're asking someone for information about themselves and they uh, don't give it, but they rely on the person who's with them to give that information. Do you see any evidence of physical abuse? Does a person that you believe is a victim seem submissive or fearful uh, of the other person? Are they having difficulty communicating because of language or cultural barriers that don't seem to line up with the person's description of their life history or that don't have an adequate explanation as to why they're not able to communicate uh, fluidly? And is the person missing identification? This is something that's very important to pay attention to. Um, missing identification and lack of an explanation for why they don't have identification in a situation where they otherwise would be expected to be able to present identification. If we combine this with the other person that's with a victim of trafficking or someone you suspect is a victim of trafficking, um, providing information to you, then we're starting to see some of the stars emerge in a constellation, some of those red flags emerging in a constellation that may suggest human trafficking. We may also see that the person is reluctant to describe injuries that they uh, 
that you observe or that they are presenting for help with. They may not be aware of where they are. Um, and if that is not better explained by, say, a neurological condition or a head injury, they're just not sure what city they're in right now, and there's no clear explanation for that. Um, that could be a sign of human trafficking. Uh, someone else is speaking for them. If multiple people are speaking for the person, if they're accompanied by multiple people and they're not able to speak on their own behalf, um, if the person, again, shows signs of not just physical abuse, but also sexual abuse, and we're looking for multiple red flags to indicate someone is a victim of human trafficking. Um, just a couple of points about this slide. So, or from this slide, if the person's under 18 and they're engaging in commercial sexual activity, that is by default and by definition in federal and state law, human trafficking. One of the other things that you want to pay attention to is how the person describes his or her life. Some of the terminology that people use when they're being sex trafficked may be indicative or may clue you in to the fact that they uh, are being trafficked. So we're looking for terminology such as the life, which is commonly uh, used to refer to prostitution, being involved in prostitution in some way. The game, which is the term used to refer to uh, sex trafficking or pimping, um, being turned out, being uh, forced into prostitution. If someone refers to when they were turned out um, or a time when they were turned out then that may be indicative of someone who has been sex trafficked or who is being sex trafficked. I won't go through all of these, but I want you to consider the importance here of knowing what terms, what words, what language someone may be using that could be a clue that this is sex trafficking. If someone says that they are shooting up with their daddy, we probably want to clarify, if you can safely clarify whether Daddy means their father or daddy is the male person in their life or their boyfriend uh, or partner. Okay. So let's shift to talking about how to help, some things to consider when offering assistance in different contexts, and then we'll talk a bit about what we're doing here in West Virginia, and then I'd be happy to answer any questions. So when it comes to intervention with human trafficking survivors, I mentioned earlier that the idea of working on a task force sometimes brings to mind um, rescuing people and, and sort of barging into dangerous situations, extracting people from those dangerous situations. Um, and that, that's really not the bulk of the assistance that we need to make available to survivors of human trafficking. Sometimes that's necessary, but I want you to consider that any scenario that you see represented in that way is the very beginning the very first step toward a long line of intervention that's actually needed. When we think about how we can develop systems of care that support human trafficking survivors making an autonomous choice to get out of trafficking safely, based on their own wisdom about what the safe path out of trafficking would be, we have three main principles that we've got to consider. The first is trauma-informed care, whether it's in social services, such as a domestic violence program or a rape crisis center, mental health treatment centers, or an emergency department. Treatment and services that are framed to understand the effect of trauma and traumatic stress on someone's behavior and their internal experiences is much more likely to be effective for that person because it's much more likely to be accessible to that person. Trauma-informed care means that everybody working in a setting is trained to understand and is knowledgeable about the way that trauma and traumatic stress affect how someone engages with people that they encounter, with people in their world. It includes training staff in any setting that you're working in, and this could include a college counseling center, this could include working in student services, anywhere could be a trauma-informed uh, setting or could become a trauma-informed setting, you're going to have your staff trained to understand the impact of trauma on someone's cultural values and vice versa. What does trauma mean in the context of somebody's culture? What does trauma mean in the context of somebody's understanding of their own life history? And how is that likely to show up in the setting in which you are working? So if I'm working with a survivor of human trafficking 
and that person checks in at the front desk and the front desk staff member is having kind of a rough day and this is like their fifth of five difficult patients describing a pretty common daily scenario in the setting that I work in. Um, and the, the person that I'm working with doesn't have their insurance card or their, their medical card. And that creates kind of a, a difficult discussion at the front desk. Like, we can't, we can't let you see Patrick today because you don't have your medical card. And we told you you got to bring your medical card. Well, someone who's been traumatized may interpret that person's behavior, that person's facial expressions, the restriction of access to something that maybe they see value in, is pretty threatening. And aggressive behavior can be conceptualized as aggressive behavior or it can be conceptualized as protective behavior, as behavior that the person has learned to use to keep themselves safe in situations where they perceive threat, just like the situation they be, may be experiencing right there in that moment. But if you don't understand traumatic stress and how it affects the person, how it affects their body, how it affects the way they see other people, it's really easy to just say, they're a difficult patient, they were being aggressive, they should be fired from this practice. We're not going to see them anymore. Right? Trauma-informed care starts by saying, let's figure out how trauma might be influencing what we're seeing here before we jump to conclusions about the person's behavior. The only conclusion we're going to jump to is that trauma could be at work here, so let's Pull off before we make any decisions about how to proceed. All right. Um, comprehensive case management is essential as well. And comprehensive case management means that, again, we're going well beyond sort of those rescue scenes, right? And identifying the needs that people have across the continuum of need. So you may meet someone at any point in their journey, often. Human trafficking survivors will first encounter either law enforcement or social service staff members, workers, when they're in crisis. We have to have effective crisis management services, but we also need to make sure that the services available for human trafficking, um, and this is something that the task force uh, that I'm a part of is working diligently out to make sure we have in place across our state. We have to make sure that the needs human trafficking survivors have, because of being trafficked, are able to be met, that we can connect the person after the crisis, the immediate crisis is over, that we can connect them to the services that they need so that they are not vulnerable to being trafficked again. Because these are cracks that they can fall through. Long-term needs are important. Things that we don't think about, like job training. You know, if you've been trafficked, if you've been sex trafficked, for two, three, four, five, ten years, it's kind of hard to just step right back into the workforce. So something like education and job training seems almost simplistic, and yet that could be the difference between long-term recovery and staying out of trafficking and being trafficked again because the person lacks the resources necessary to support themselves, and the trafficker knows it, and they're right back there to offer those things that nobody else can provide at the cost of the person's freedom. The last principle here, collaboration and respect for autonomy, and this is challenging. This is definitely a derivative from work that we do in domestic violence, which is where I first encountered and started working with human trafficking survivors. The idea that the person who is in a trafficking situation may not be ready to leave when you identify that that's a trafficking situation, that that's a trafficking victim. They may not feel that it's safe for them to leave. And they may not, probably will not, use the term human trafficking or sex trafficking. They're not likely to think about themselves in that way. That's not something that their trafficker is talking about with them. So they may not be ready to leave that situation. We have to respect that person's autonomy so that we don't fall into a role of being one more person telling them what they have to do. They already have that. They're already being trafficked. They're already being told what they have to do. We have to respect their autonomy. That's something that is different than the scenario that they're in. Okay, so what's next? What can we actually do about this with the information that we talked about today? Um, we have to take whatever steps that we can, and this is at least a thousand mile journey, if not longer. It's long as a journey for anti, those doing anti-trafficking work. It is an incredibly long journey for trafficking survivors. 
And that is one of the reasons that having trafficking survivors involved in anti-trafficking initiatives is essential. Any work that gets done to address human trafficking has got to include human trafficking survivors. We are fortunate on our task force to have representation from the trafficking survivor community. Um, I, I'm hopeful that we will have more going forward, but we do have a trafficking survivor on our task force with whom we can collaborate and who can help us be innovative. Um, our task force, um, outside of our survivor representative, consists of law enforcement, um, Department of Homeland Security, uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, intelligence community representatives from the Intelligence Fusion Center, the U.S. Attorney's Office, West Virginia, West Virginia Attorney General's Office, service providers and domestic violence and rape crisis centers, clinicians such as myself, researchers and academics also such as myself and some of my colleagues um, from around the state. All of us are working together collaboratively on various committees within the task force to address specific aspects of human trafficking. Um, the important thing is collaboration among all of these committees. We work as diligently as we can not to get siloed. So I serve on the top three of these, and then I chair this one. And all of the work that I'm doing, and many of the my committee members on here are also working on these other committees. In fact, I've got representatives from all of the committees on the Trafficking Activity Monitoring Committee because we need all hands on deck, and we need lots of really smart minds thinking about how we're going to address this in a dynamic way. So a few of our initiatives here that are important for you to be aware of. Um, one, I mentioned earlier the Mountain State Human Trafficking Mapping Project, which is aimed at identifying the incidence and prevalence of human trafficking victim encounters across these settings, social service settings, healthcare settings, educational settings, including uh, elementary school settings, mi uh, middle school settings, high school settings, college settings, law enforcement context. Um, our goal with this project is to understand how frequently, within a one-year time period, people in these settings, service providers in these settings, encounter at least one survivor of human trafficking, and to understand how many survivors of human trafficking people are encountering in those settings as well. Um, one of our other initiatives is improving the identification of human trafficking survivors, um, improving how we assess for human trafficking, how we identify people in human trafficking when they're presenting in uh, social service and other settings. Um, and we are collaborating with others to develop innovative solutions based on West Virginia data. So once we have data collected uh, on prevalence and incidence rates and the patterns of human trafficking, that data can be used to inform interventions and will be used to inform interventions, ranging from law enforcement to public awareness, public health-based interventions, to technology-based interventions um, that involve machine learning. I'm going to talk very briefly about the one of the initiatives up there uh, in a little more detail, the initiative to better identify human trafficking victims. Um, we've identified a tool that uh, has very strong empirical support for being able to identify human trafficking survivors in social service settings. This is the Trafficking Victim Identification Tool. The task force has hosted several trainings across the state over the past year that has been aimed at training as many social service providers as possible on the use of this tool. The quick overview of this tool is that it's effective for identifying both males and females, adults and children down to age 13. It's effective for identification of victims who are non-English speaking as well as English speaking victims and is the only tool that can be used to identify uh, sex and labor trafficking. It's got a high degree of accuracy. The short version of the tool can capture 80, with 88% accuracy human trafficking survivors, so true positives. Non-survivors are also screened out at an, about an 85% rate, so we're likely to identify people who are actually survivors of trafficking and likely to differentiate them quite accurately from those who are not. Um, and there isn't any significant difference with age, sex, or trafficking type. Um, this is a very effective tool, and one of our goals right now is 
to get as many people using it as possible. This also will allow for better collection of data so that we can have a more accurate estimate of how frequently human trafficking survivors are being encountered across settings. The more people who are using this, the better our data will be. So those two initiatives serve one another intentionally. Um, these are some examples of questions that are from the tool in the service of time and our time limits. Uh, I won't go over each one of these individually. If you do want to know more information about this, I'm happy to talk with you about this sidebar after the presentation. Um, beyond just training social service providers and healthcare providers, um, we have to understand ways to more innovatively identify and intervene in human trafficking. Um, these takes a variety of forms, but some of the more cutting edge, most cutting edge work that's being done involves artificial intelligence uh, and what we refer to as machine learning, which are often synonymous with one another. The idea is to use machines, to use computer algorithms to identify patterns of activity that are indicative of human trafficking. We're just at the beginning in the anti-trafficking anti field of starting to do some of that work. Um, I'm going to wrap up with one last video that talks about some of the most innovative work being done by this. It's a relatively brief video that's fast moving. Um, I'll wrap up with that and then take any questions that you have. of thousands of other kids. The men asked me to take off my clothes. They undress. They play with themselves. They want me to play with myself. As soon as I go online, they come to me. Ten, hundred, every hour. So many. But what they don't know I'm not real. I'm a computer model made piece by piece to track down these men who do this. Webcam child sex tourism is a new phenomenon that's spreading like an epidemic. Men from rich countries pay children in poor countries to perform sexual acts in front of webcams. These crimes happen tens of thousands of times each day. Terzom Netherlands is overwhelmed by child victims in the Philippines. So we approached them and offered our help. We started our own investigation, focusing on the demand side, and this is what we found. The UN and the FBI estimate that 750,000 pedophiles are online at any given moment. We estimate that tens of thousands of kids, some of them only six years old, are abused behind cams in the Philippines alone. But instead of hundreds of thousands of convictions, we could only find six men who have ever been charged. We found that webcam child sex tourism is a crime in almost every country, but laws are not enforced because child victims don't go to the police. Our solution? Proactive policing. To stop predators, we need to patrol the websites where they commit these crimes and catch them in the act. To show the world how this can be done, we went undercover posing as a 10-year-old Filipino girl on public chat rooms. The moment that you log in and you identify yourself as a young girl from the Philippines, they swarm at you. Do you like to wear your bra? Hello. Hi, honey. Can we talk? Hey, are you I'm 36, okay? The predators feel safe and anonymous. They use fake names, live far away, and can pay with untraceable prepaid credit cards you can buy anywhere. All of the men wanted us to turn on our webcam, so to maintain our cover and to catch more predators, we brought Sweetie to life. Sweetie is a computer model we created to look and move like a real girl. 
we captured the movements of a real person and applied them to Sweetie. And then, we used an application to control her every move. I'm not real. Men think she's sitting in front of a webcam in the Philippines. But actually, we were operating her from a warehouse in the capital of the Netherlands, Amsterdam. While men chatted with Sweetie, we tracked them down. Using bits of information they gave us, we identified them with Google, Facebook, and other public sources. Without hacking their computers, we collected their names, addresses, phone numbers, pictures, and live video footage. In just 10 weeks, we identified 1,000 predators from 71 countries. If we can trace 1,000 men in 10 weeks, police forces can trace more than 100,000 a year. To raise global awareness and to pressure governments to act, we invited the world press to The Hague for one of the biggest child sex abuse cases in recent history. We showed our short film and handed over the dossiers of the 1,000 predators to Interpol. Instantly, Sweetie became world news. This is CNN News. Webcam sex tourism. Terre des Hommes heeft duizend mannen van over de hele wereld betrapt. The names of 46 Australians have been handed to international police. Investigators tracked down their addresses and photos and handed them over to Interpol. She is the weapon against online sex tourism. Para ver a menores en situaciones sexuales. Increíble, no? Tens of thousands. Thousand mannen worden ontlast door more details from Interpol. I'm of course very happy for Terre des Hommes that they have made this case. Terre des Hommes, is in the middle of the virtual. I am Brahma Swiri. Terre des Hommes, internet. Sweetie and this apartment for ten men. Two of them are Brazilian. Obviously, for the Federation in all the world. Van Lien Hong Kong. This was the initiative of Holland. It's me, Sweetie. Basta. For camera. I'm not real. I'm not real. The results: one billion people have seen the Sweetie campaign. Webcam child sex tourism is now a globally recognized problem, and the Philippines National Police now consider it the country's number one crime. But what we're most proud of, predators are being stopped, and children are being saved. The National Crime Agency said 17 people from Britain have been arrested in Operation Endeavour, which spanned 14 countries. There were 29 other arrests, including 11 people suspected of facilitating the abuse in the Philippines, where around 15 children aged 6 to 15 were rescued after being identified as victims. There are sitting at home tonight who think that they can go online and target these children. They can believe that they will be found. Okay, so we can find innovative solutions to sex trafficking, to human trafficking of all forms. Um, there are a variety of initiatives right now nationwide to, again, use technological innovations to better identify and intervene uh, in sex trafficking situations. In West Virginia, that's somewhere that we aim to get for. It's a place that we aspire to be. Um, we're starting with beginning to understand the scope of the problem and moving on from there. But that's definitely the type of innovation that's on our radar as a task force. Um, in closing here, there are a couple of resources to keep in mind. If you think that you are seeing a situation that is trafficking, if it's an emergency situation, please call 911. Someone's life is in danger. If there is an imminent risk of harm, if it's a child call 911. If it's something that you're just not sure about, that you want someone to check out and look into further, this is a number to the Human Trafficking Hotline, which is staffed by the Human National Human Trafficking Resource Center, which is run by Polaris, one of the oldest anti-human trafficking organizations in the US. When you make a phone call to the hotline, I mentioned earlier that the uh, hotline staff will apply specific criteria to determine whether this is likely to be a case of human trafficking. If it does meet criteria for uh, either being a likely or uh, definite case of human trafficking based on Polaris's criteria, um, they will send that information out to Law, uh, law enforcement 
at the state and federal level here in West Virginia. So um, the West Virginia State Police are notified. The unit of the FBI in West Virginia is notified. Uh, the West Virginia Intelligence Fusion Center is notified. And the Department of Homeland Security is also notified. Um, so there can be an intervention after you call Polaris. Um, another resource to keep in mind, we don't have a hotline for our task force, but uh, the task force website uh, is there, and we provide information about upcoming trainings on that website, information about human trafficking in West Virginia as we get it, ways to get involved in anti-trafficking work. Um, so this is a useful resource for uh, information about human trafficking in West Virginia and the work that the task force is doing. Um, at this point, I want to say thank you so much for your time and attention, and I would take any questions or comments or observations that anybody has. Yes? Yes. Absolutely, it can be, and it's going to be. That is one of the targets. Healthcare settings, especially emergency departments, um, are a target for the training committee for the task force. Um, that's definitely something that's near and dear to my heart because I work in a healthcare environment. Uh, but yes, and there is a protocol that's been developed for use in healthcare settings. It was developed by the HEAL Trafficking Group, HEAL standing for Health education, advocacy, linkage, heal trafficking. Um, full disclosure, I was a co-editor on the protocol, um, but it's uh, nonetheless, despite my bias there, it, it's an effective protocol for addressing trafficking and identifying trafficking victims in healthcare settings. And that is what we are aiming to implement or help hospitals decide whether or not they can implement through training. So yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's like identifying traffickers. That is such a good question. So at this point, there is no tool that's been published for identifying people with intent to traffic or identifying the intention to traffic. Um, we would be looking more for what we might think of as soft signs um, that would indicate that someone may be um, intending to traffic someone. That is really difficult to ascertain, though, in a foster care application and even in an interview. One of the um, behaviors, and there, the typically the uh, screening criteria to become a foster parent would keep someone who wants to traffic a child out, but that's only to the extent that the behaviors that go along with trafficking are, are known. Um, and so we may recommend a more extensive background check that involves not just screening the person for criminal history and involvement with uh, child protective services with their own kids or other kids, but um, a more extensive background check that you might have for, say, law enforcement. Uh, the resources necessary to do that are, are not quite there, I think. And that is something that is of interest to the federal government. Um, one of the mo more recent grant re request for applications that came out this year, so request for applications for a grant um, to fund anti-trafficking work, and had that as one of the targets being not foster parents, but better identification of, better understanding of traffickers. We put a lot of resources in to trafficking victims and have almost completely ignored um, the trafficker side of that. Not entirely. We do know some uh, about traffickers, 
but not nearly enough. So that, that's a major target going forward nationally. I saw another hand go up somewhere over here. Yes. Sure. So I, I would say I don't have any knowledge of that being an obstacle. So people being prosecuted and instead of um, identified as a victim. The more work that we do to train law enforcement, the less that's going to happen anyway. Um, the bigger problem that we will see with trafficking is that the trafficker will use the discourse around immigration as a way to instill fear in the victim. And that'll go something like this. Well, if you go to the cops, if you really think that I'm doing all this terrible stuff, you go to the cops, um, look at the news. They're just going to, they're just going to ship you out. And then you're going to go back to the place that you couldn't wait to get out of because it was so dangerous. Um, so traffickers will use that uh, to instill fear. But the more awareness that we do, the less of an obstacle um, that becomes. Yes. That is what we are. We are in the process of finding out. Um, we and I can't speak to those data yet. I mean, in terms of where human trafficking cases happen, we've seen trafficking cases in Charleston, Wheeling, um, Parkersburg, uh, Huntington. Um, the question about whether those are hot spots is is something that only good data will tell us. Well, I highlight that, or I kind of hone in on that point of good data, because what we don't want to assume is, well, it's just happening in these places, so we just think it's happening, or most crimes more likely to happen anyway, because it could be happening in places we don't expect. And that's important to keep in mind. And it could look like things that we're not expecting. Um, you know, one of the things that we are going to be able to better understand is the relationship um, between trafficking and uh, substance use, and, and substance uh, trafficking as well. And we may see something that looks like prostitution to serve someone's drug habit that could actually be trafficking. Um, but if it's happening in a place that we don't expect it to, or that we just assume it, it wouldn't happen, because this is just where the opioid crisis happened, not, not where the sex trafficking problem happens, that's our assumption, then we don't see what's actually there. So, so we know that there are cases that have happened in those areas that I mentioned, whether those are the only places or whether it's more likely, we can't say that yet. Sure. Mm -hmm. So do you mean in terms of anti-trafficking work or soliciting people? Um, so labor trafficking can be solicited um, or can involve solicitation for a variety of different um, types of labor. It may involve maybe construction, maybe restaurant work, it may be any of those sectors that I mentioned earlier. Um, the thing is, the less regulated something is, the, the less attention that can be paid to whether labor laws are being enforced, um, the less enforcement of labor laws, uh, the more likely that labor trafficking can happen. So it, it could happen in that way with those kinds of advertisements. If someone's not paying attention, no one's looking at how those labor laws are being enforced for any of those industries. Other questions or comments or observations? Uh, my personal goals for trafficking? <laughs> sure, for the task force. Um, so one is to increase the training that we provide across sectors. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the healthcare sector is especially important because of the recognition that healthcare settings are 
one common environment, uh, one common opportunity to serve human trafficking victims. Um, one of our goals, data collection-wise, uh, is to complete the mapping project, um, which is going to be surveying physicians and other healthcare providers, uh, people in education settings, again, uh, primary and secondary schools, as well as uh, higher education, law enforcement officials. So completing that project and developing our first estimates uh, of prevalence and incidence of human trafficking. I am in collaboration with my colleagues on the committee. I'm the chair of that, that initiative. Yes. Yeah, the process of meeting their needs. Sure. So, sort of, sort of both. And um, right now, legislatively, the um, bulk of the responsibility for serving survivors of human trafficking falls to domestic violence organizations and rape crisis centers. Um, so, for example, if someone is identified as a victim of human trafficking and uh, law enforcement is called, and then that person needs to get connected to services, crisis services, for example. Um, rape crisis centers, uh, rape crisis center advocates would be uh, the responding advocates, responding people. So that is currently falling to them. And then the case management that happens really starts there. But the, there is a collective, I said, you know, it's sort of both and. There's a collective in that um, rape crisis centers and domestic violence organizations uh, are represented on our task force. And so one of the goals of the task force, like any task force, is make sure that all of the, like the network of resources that's needed to do the work is in place. Um, so knowing what resources are available in the community that that advocate or case manager can connect the person to, um, combined with their knowledge of what human trafficking survivors are likely to need, is part of how we're addressing that right now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like immigrant mothers who are not allowed, not able to leave. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not aware of any systematic data that's been collected on that specifically, but what you're describing would easily be exploited by a trafficker. That's a clear area where the person, this mother, could be coerced into remaining in the whatever the labor situation is, whatever the trafficker wants her to do, whether it's sexual exploitation or otherwise. So I'm not aware of systematic data on that specifically. Um, but we do know that traffickers exploit that type of situation pretty readily, and they would recognize that as an opportunity for them, the trafficker would. Um, so that, that's an example of one of the areas we need more data to be collected on how often is that used. When we think about collecting data on traffickers, one of the things that we do need more information about is what strategies traffickers typically use. Um, what can we expect from a typical trafficker in terms of the ways that they'll try to exploit their victim. That could go a long way for educating youth about what to look out for, for educating anyone about what to look out for and someone that may try to exploit them, may try to traffic them. So uh, if we know how common that is, then we can raise awareness about the ways that people may be vulnerable to getting into that situation. There's a lot of areas that we need more research in, which is why, as I said at the beginning here, you all can actually make 
an impact in anti-trafficking work. You can get involved in this in some way. We need people to be creative and innovative in how we do this work. We've got a lot more of it to do. Other questions or comments? Yes. So I'm not familiar with the Nordic model. Would you explain? It? Oh, okay. Okay, so boy, that is a whole presentation in and of itself. Um, so decriminalizing prostitution and criminalizing the job. So the what I would say about that is this. Um, the, the best data available would sit, and this comes from a study by Cho and colleagues in 2013 that researched for patterns of human trafficking, sex trafficking specifically, post decriminalization. Um, and what they found across 150 countries is that decriminalizing prostitution does not lead to a decrease, it does not significantly predict a decrease in sex trafficking cases. What does significantly predict a decrease in sex trafficking cases is enforcement of existing laws against sex trafficking. Um, you know, an, I guess one, I won't, I'm not going to take a position on the legalization of prostitution one way or another, um, but what I would say related to that is that Many of the industries that I had listed up there in the Polaris's topology of modern slavery, um, those are legal. Um, so an industry's, uh, an industry being legal or illicit doesn't necessarily preclude trafficking from happening. And so if we were to adopt that model, we would still need to do more work. There would still be other areas. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is also important, I think, related to this to, to know is that if you have been arrested for or convicted of prostitution in the context of human trafficking, one of the updates to our, our state law is that um, that conviction can be expunged. Um, so it will not follow you into the next phase of your life. Um, so it doesn't necessarily get at being able to provide services by being able to document someone through arresting them for prostitution. Um, but for, for people who have been involved in the justice system and who've had an adversarial relationship with the justice system because of what human traffickers have forced them to do, um, there, there is a way for that to not continue, for them to receive services and for that to not continue to adversely impact their life for the rest of their life. Um, okay, okay. All right, I know that we are quite over on time and I appreciate all of the discussion. I want to defer back to Debbie to, for any final comments that you have or anything else that you want our learners to know here. Well, we definitely do appreciate the education that we can learn. Education is the best investment. Thank you. Thank you.